I want to tell a little story on my dear departed dad. Uh, he was a, a pilot in the Royal Air Force during World War II. He was um, trained, uh, actually took his wings at Brantford, Ontario in Canada, soloed in St. Catharines. And that's how we met my mother, because my mother's father used to go down to the barracks and call out, anybody here love the Lord Jesus? And whoever responded positively, he'd take them home, give them supper, and uh, disciple them, and write to their mothers back in the old country and tell them, I'm looking after your boy for you. And my father was one of hundreds of airmen uh, who went through the home during the war. He returned after the war and he and his parents settled in St. Catharines, and that's how I ended up being a Canadian instead of a Scotsman. Well, uh, my father was uh, commissioned. Uh, he became a flight lieutenant. I think he's only 22 years old. And uh, after some time in, in the UK, he was sent out to what was then the, the Far East. Uh, he practiced bombing, and he was really quite horrified at the thought that he, he knew everyone was involved in the war effort, but he didn't want to be dropping bombs on civilians. But it turned out that um, after he reached proficiency, he was put into transport command and spent the war dropping 500-pound rice bags and other provisions behind the lines, primarily in Burma, up to the, the hump, over the hump, as they say, uh, up to the Chinese border, uh, providing for the Burmese, uh, the Chindits, and also for uh, British troops there. In any case, uh, there was a uh, staging center in what is now Pakistan, what was then India, Karachi, just outside of Karachi. It was um, Marapur, RAF base. And uh, tens of thousands of young men went through that base as they were being redistributed to their various locations in the Far East. Now, my father flew a Lancaster bomber. He was the pilot, and there was a crew of seven. And not just the pilot, there was the navigator and the flight engineer and the uh, bombardier or the bomb aimer, and um, there was also uh, the wireless operator, and then there were two gunners, one in the mid uh, upper gunner and then the worst position in the plane was the tail gunner. You could get trapped in there and uh, not be able to get out to use your parachute and go down with the plane. Well, it so happened that at one point five of the seven crew were moved off uh, to work somewhere else and my father was only left with his navigator. His navigator's name was Harry Sutton. He was a godly Christian. And so the two of them ended up for quite a few weeks in at this base in Karachi with basically nothing to do, waiting for their air crew numbers to be made up. And so they begged and borrowed every gospel track they could find. And every day they went through these huge barracks, these Quonset huts, where there were thousands and thousands of young men who were either just back from seeing death in the face or were going out to face very often certain death. And so it was a, an environment that was ideal for the sharing of the gospel. Well, Harry was going one way and my father was going another way on this particular occasion. And as he came towards the end of one of these huts, there was a door ahead and outside the door there was a, a grassy area, quad, and then over to another building. And so he would continue. And as he approached the end of the bunks, he noticed a young man with his shirt off, quite well muscled, leaning up on the top bunk, looking at the picture of a pretty girl. And the devil quite clearly said to my dad, Nicholson, this guy's not interested. Keep moving. And um, 
My father actually went and opened the door and stepped out onto the grass when the Spirit of God seemed to say to him, Nicholson, get back in there. Get back in there and tell that man about your Savior. And so he returned and he said to the young man, let me tell you what just happened. As I was coming by you and I saw you standing there looking at that picture of a girl, I think it was the enemy of your soul that told me, you're not interested, so just keep moving. But I got out onto the grass in the quad here, and I think it was the Spirit of God who loves your soul and wants to save you, who said to me, get back in there and share the gospel with that man. And the fellow gave a wry smile, and he pointed to the picture of this young lady. And he said, you see that girl there? She's back in England. I want to marry her, but she won't marry me because she's a Christian, and I'm not. <laughs> you know, we are so easily fooled. We're so quick to misjudge the situation. So that person's not interested. I think of the little verse found over in Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and verse 6. And it says this, In the morning sow your seed, and in the evening do not withhold your hand. For you do not know which will prosper, either this or that, or whether both alike will be good. I preached on one occasion with a, an African-American brother up in the city of Chicago. He had grown up in that neighborhood and gone to that Sunday school. But in his teen years, he began to take drugs and got heavily involved in drug addiction. He drifted south, ended up living on the streets, and one day sleeping on a park bench, a Christian came along and showed him kindness and said, come on to my house, I'll give you a place to shower and a change of clothes and something to eat. And poured into his heart the love of God. And at that point, this dear man was, was overseeing five rescue missions in the area of Memphis, Tennessee. And he said this, lying on that park bench under the influence of drugs, I didn't look like the harvest. I didn't look like I was a soul ripe for picking, but I was. And so, Christian, as you move through life, the enemy will use this lie. He's not interested. She's not interested. How do you know? But that person has just heard the news that a loved one has died or that some tragedy has occurred and their heart has been touched and they're raw and they're ready to hear a word from God. So may the Lord encourage us to realize that um, we're not God. And when he prompts us to say something, do it. Because you never know which will prosper, either this or that or whether both alike will be good.